Um, uh, Tom Tanner from the, from the IDS, uh, if I can just come to you. Uh, do you think, and we've heard from, uh, from Simon that silos definitely do exist, I and mean, you come, if you like, more from the climate change side than the humanitarian side, do you see silos? And have they yeah. got their windows open? I think I've been brought here uh, s as a, a set up as a, a classic adaptation person who doesn't get the conflict <laughs> and security thing. I feel like uh, heisting myself in my own petard. Um, those those things do still exist. I'm, I think I'm testament to it. Um, I haven't dealt a lot with uh, in work worked a lot in fragile states. Um, I haven't. I'm not an expert in conflict. Don't understand kind of conflict and security analysis very well. I think the difference is the ability to understand that weakness and draw in people who do actually work on that issue. So the problem for me is where the silo, as you say, doesn't have windows and doesn't allow you to work outside and bring others in um, around the same table. I'm quite, I'm quite positive about the resilience agenda and, and, and the use of resilience as jargon to some extent um, because it has that integrative complex complexity underpinning. When it's used just as a, a find and replace on a Word document for adaptation, I don't like it. But it doesn't have to be deep, e deep ecology theory resilience. Uh, it just needs to be integrative complexity, you know, interrelated, complex interrelated systems thinking. And that opens our own mind and awareness of our own limitations. I don't think we can all become experts in everything. Um, but there are, I mean, there, are, there are lessons, I think, for, for that for all of us. I, I, I had to give a presentation on resilience recently and wrote it into a song. Uh, which was quite critical, <laughs> which is quite critical, don't worry, I won't sing it. It was quite critical oh, of resilience theory. <laughs> but the opening, um, the opening um, verse was, uh, resilience has such great appeal as a word, I like the way it makes me feel. So I think that's quite important. <laughs> uh, resilience is cool, an integrating tool. If you don't like it, you must be a fool. It brings us together around the same table. With a common language, we are better able to work across <laughs> sectors and across scales. That way, we're less likely to fail. So, <laughs> oh, thanks. I think it's. I think that is a really that is a really strong, um, a strong uh, advocate for for resilience thinking, because it does help us to do that and just open our eyes to uh, to where we might might need to go. I have. I think having said that, I have I still have deep misgivings about what the the, the forces driving a lack of so the anti-integration agenda is still a stronger driver than the integration agenda, and I particularly think the institutional drivers. Um, are much, much, much stronger, and particularly for me, the post-2015, you have three post-2015 agendas with, you know, trying to send satellites out to each of them to talk, oh, let's get the climate person who needs to go to the disasters meeting to try and push climate in the disasters thing, and then and within the, all... Sorry, can you just explain why, particularly post-2015, what was the issue there? Three, there are three um, agreements or frameworks uh, due for agreement. There's the, 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 the second phase of the Hyogo framework on disaster risk reduction, there's the, the new climate change deal uh, due in Paris under the UNFCCC, uh, due in Paris in December of next year. And there's the post-Millennium Development Goals Agreement, the post-2015 development agenda. So you have the development, the climate, and the disasters people all flying around the world, all releasing reports of how to integrate their thing into the other thing. And, um, I mean, if, if we're going to be... If we're going to be... Take radical steps to address that integration agenda, they are to actually cut some of them out of those things. So, dare I say, cut adaptation out of the UNFCCC and put it into the MDG agenda. Make the response to climate change that doesn't require international law and an international, legal international agreement, take that bit and put it into the development bit of the MDG agenda where we know that the majority of the solutions for adapting to climate change need to be done in order to be integrative. Um, why do you think particularly um organizations are attracted to these kind of physical, if you like, these technological approaches, these physical things on the ground? Um, I guess you have to put yourself in the mindset of uh, a bureaucrat. Think of being a bureaucrat in an environment ministry in a developing country. You're bound by having, first of all, having to demonstrate what's climatey about this problem. Because you're working on climate change, you're trying to access climate change, international climate change funding, uh, and that funding is very important for what your department does. So you're, all, you're almost automatically led by this, what the scientists would call detection and attribution. So what's the climate change bit of the cause relative to the, the, the human development bit of the cause? And th that tends to lead you to the 
thinking about the science of climate and the hazard, um, rather than the, the human side. To some extent, it's, it's about visibility as well. So doing something that's more technological, that's particularly infrastructural, is more visible, so you can demonstrate the impacts of what you've done. Um, I quite like the phrase adaptation by ribbon cutting, which the idea of you need to, someone, some politician needs to open the thing you're doing. So, you know, a capacity building program doesn't really have the same appeal as, you know, a, a giant uh, sea defense in terms of uh, cutting the ribbon. Um, but I also think it's just pragmatism. You're, you're set up in, in the bureaucratic mindset, and there's a great deal of urgency in delivering. And that kind of technological, the managerial approach, uh, for the hard systems approach to dealing with adaptation is driven by the urgency to deliver. And there's this massive urgency to get climate funding dispersed and spent and demonstrate that we're taking action uh, and taking action quickly. Why do you think that hastiness can be damaging? Because it's, it's, it's very difficult to do political economy analysis, conflict sensitivity analysis, and to do the more integrative approaches that you might need to actually draw in all the different expertise. It takes time. It's much more complicated, it's harder to deliver, and it, take, and it's, it takes a longer time to assess um, the effectiveness as well. So if you're evaluating the response to a complex solution, then it's going to be harder to work out whether you've got it right or not than we built this seawall and so far it hasn't been breached. <laughs> Do you agree with Simon that sometimes putting the word climate in, in, the, in the paper opens doors to finance? Absolutely. I, I do remember in the run-up to Copenhagen, it was you could point to almost any inanimate object and find a study about, um, you know, formica tables and climate change. The latest <laughs> report. It was. It became that. You know, everyone was in on it. But you know, for me as someone who thinks that climate change is the most pressing development problem of our time and the future, that was kind of no bad thing. It was the way of building political momentum. And we, we discussed in, w among the panel over lunch actually earlier that. I find the, the link to securitization, the securitization agenda, dangerous. Even Nicholas Stern's article in The Guardian last week, he, he used the phrase will. It was uh, that, that climate change will lead to conflict and, and wars. And it wasn't even tailored with some the, the, the climate uh, scientists who were always may or not willing to. But it was, to, it was designed to be polemic, to put climate change on the UK flood, flooding agenda. And um, I increasingly think if if we're going to have to bring those people whose values don't in, don't generally the conservative, generally right wing, do not um, the more individualistic, who don't want climate change to be something they have to deal with, if we have to appeal to those values to bring them on board, then we need to start embracing the securitization, the immigration agenda, um, yeah, <laughs> because otherwise we're, we're going to be fighting a. a fighting a, a fight that is in the minority without the um, support of the majority. I'd like to give you a microphone. Can you articulate that noise? Can you, can you turn that noise into a thought, please? I think you should uh, do the noise again, Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had this debate for many, many years. In terms of sec uh, securitizing any issue, I think that actually has an underpinning of morality in it. In a good is, way? Is you mean it that, that's correct? It, it should have that, or it doesn't. No, have no, no. I don't. I don't think it's. Um, although I recognise our culture sometimes requires um, bringing on, you know, right side um, views. I, I still don't think that's the inroad. I, I think we need more education rather than kind of pandering to that kind of. Um, well, I'm going to get myself in trouble, but <laughs> difficult, I guess, pandering <laughs> to, you know, quite um, naive understandings. Um, so I think it is a morality question that you know, that people don't necessarily want to look at. Okay, thank you. But is, is, it, is it wrong if we're using climate change to scare people into caring? Um, well, if, if it's completely unrelated, yes. I think we're not, it's, it's not, we're not using it just to scare people to care. It's more about trying to link the climate change challenge and solving the climate change challenge with people's underlying value systems and beliefs. Because if it's presented in a way that directly challenges their values and beliefs, um, they will more naturally tend towards climate skepticism 
in order to be able to dismiss those claims. And I think that's, that's the real challenge, is to, is to make this problem meaningful to as many people as possible around the world in order that they buy into actually tackling it.